I would love to introduce my panelists. They are fantastic. I've got two Michaels and a Colin. Awesome. So I've got Michael Hogan, who is a research economist in economic development at RTI. RTI excuse me. Um, I've got Colin Kaiser, who is the International Business Development Manager at the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, focusing on India and Europe. And of course, we've got Michael Haley, the Executive Director of Wake County Economic Development. Um, so I've got a, some initial, just general questions for all of them, and then I've got individual questions, and then we'll do Q&A. Hope that sounds great to everyone, and we will just kick things off. Michael, I'm just going to hand the microphone to you. Right. What drives economic development in RTP? Sure. Thanks, everybody, um, for, for having us, Michael. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I think really when it comes down to what drives economic development, broadly speaking, in this market, it's four things. It's pretty easy. Uh, for me, it's talent, uh, higher education ecosystem, diverse economy, and high quality of life. So let me enumerate those just a little bit more if I could. So when it comes to talent, <clears throat> the idea of, of both the, the highly skilled and call, we sort of call rightly skilled talent in the marketplace is critical. So I'll, I'll give a couple quick points on that. 46.8% um, of the people in this market have a bachelor's degree or more. So to give you a sense of what does that mean in relation to other metros around the country domestically, um, that sort of puts us in that echelon with, it's a higher than Seattle, Seattle's about 47% or so. Um, it, it's, uh, San Jose and San Francisco, those two metro areas are close to 49% apiece. Um, and then Washington DC is about 48.9 or so percent and you have to have this the required joke they have to say but are there really that many smart people in Washington DC? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's debatable. So uh, thank you. It's a, that's an economic development joke. Um, so <laughs> so um, so I think that's an important aspect of, of who we are as a community. So that idea of talent is critical. When it comes to the diverse economy, why is that important? Well it's important for a couple of reasons. In North Carolina I use the analogy as a North Carolinian of what we don't want to be as a mill town. Now, in North Carolina, the historical perspective of that is you don't want to be in a mill town in which everybody works at the mill, you shop at the mill store, you live in the mill house. If you don't work at the mill, you ain't got nowhere to go. So for us, we want to have this really diverse economy for a couple of reasons. Raise your hand if you were born in Raleigh in this room. Wow. Congratulations. Okay. Raise your hand if you were born somewhere in North Carolina. Raise your hand if you were born somewhere in the United States. <laughs> Raise your hand if you were born somewhere else outside of the United States. That's who this community is, okay? So what's exciting about the talent is this market has the ability to draw talent literally from around the world. So talent's absolutely critical to what we do. It's the, it's the hallmark, the benchmark of what we do for every day. Um, and, that, and that diverse economy is what drives it. It allows people to move here, whether it's technology, as, as you all are technologists, life sciences, um, fintech, um, you know, government, education, sort of those big drivers of our economy. I like to tell people from around the world is this is, an econ this is a market of what's next. The idea that we have these convergence of technologies and companies that are thinking about what's the next idea, what's the next service, what's the next sort of breakthrough. That's who we are as a community. That's critical. Higher education ecosystem, one need not look but across where we are right now to the biotechnology uh, campus of NC State University, part of Centennial Campus, that's the big farm next door. Um, so that's a, a big seller for us is we have three tier one research universities. But it doesn't end there. We also have three historically black colleges and universities. The largest all women's college in the Southeast US is across the street from us. We have this amazing array of higher educational assets, but we're not just a widget factory. We don't just output students all the time. You know, we have 176,000 people enrolled in higher education here, 46,000 graduates will be 
46,000 degrees to be conferred, many of which this weekend over Mother's Day in this marketplace. But it's more than just graduates. It's how companies can partner with our universities. That's the most critical element for us. And then quality of life. Hey, it's great if you can, if you're recruiting employees down or growing new employees here out of our universities, they don't want to stay here. It's not a great place for them. They have options to go somewhere else. If you're highly skilled, highly educated, and highly in demand, you've cornered the market. You can go anywhere in the world if you want to. So for us to maintain that talent is critical. So you have to have a great place to live. That's one of the, the key drivers for us. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to uh, start on the next one? Sure. Um, so what motivates uh, technology-related companies to relocate to this area? Michael should probably answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, uh, Colin Kaiser, just maybe some uh, helpful background. Uh, I work for the Economic Development Partnership, and we're statewide. So though I'm a resident of Raleigh, um, represent the entire state, which again, uh, a lot of the same factors come into play. The fact that North Carolina has a diverse economy, a high quality of life, a l large talent pool across multiple industries. Um, so a, a lot of my answers, I'll be uh, a little more brief just because I think Michael really, I'm going to be regurgitating what he said. It's a lot of the same things. Um, just a few things that I would add for tech companies in particular is diving a little deeper into the value that the universities bring. We're not just universities that bring talent into the health or biotech arena. We have that. I mean, we have um, two of the top um, medical schools in the Southeast, and they're not just pumping out MDs, but they're bringing um, biotechnicians and biologicians and people who are in life sciences. And that's just at, at, at UNC and Duke, and then you've actually got more life science focused grads coming out of NC State. But all that to say, I think it's the multi and interdisciplinary nature of the universities that make our tech talent um, unique and attractive. We're not just bringing people who do product development. It's not just software. It's not people who are just looking towards and knowing this one application, but uh, the Institute for Advanced Analytics at NC State is a perfect example of that. Yes, it's very heavy on statistics, and it's, it, you know, they're pumping out data scientists, but the applications, and you look at the applications that, that goes towards, and you look at where those graduates are being hired into within North Carolina and across the globe, you really realize that our universities are doing very well at bringing tech talent that can use their knowledge for uh, in a multiplicity of applications in the industry sectors. And even if we're just talking tech, which again, what, what does that even mean anymore? If you're a company and you're not tech enabled, you're already dead or you'll be dead in 10 years, or f five years, rather. It doesn't matter whether you're in food, whether you're in logistics, whether you're doing software development, uh, or if you're a, an advanced manufacturing company that does forging. If you are not tech enabled, if you're not getting computer science and aerospace engineers coming out of NC State, you're, you're, you're done. So I think that that is something that really makes our area, and especially the educational assets that we have, very unique. Um, something else is cost. I think that we all know, especially people that are running businesses in this area, Raleigh is not the super low cost area that it used to be. It's because we've been, we've done very well. So. Uh, uh, salaries are going up, you know, cost per square foot of, of real estate is coming up, but um, I have more of an international focus. I'm talking to companies that are coming out of Switzerland, that are coming out of Sweden, and coming out of India, especially right now. This, I just returned from a trip from India, and we, we spoke with a lot of ICT companies, and when they look towards U.S. expansion, they're like, well, we'll go to New York or San Francisco, obviously, right? No, <laughs> you don't just have to look there. New York and San Francisco are always going to be New York and San Francisco. They're great places to do business, but it's hard. It's really, really difficult right now. And you see Credit Suisse, you know, bringing 1,800 people from Manhattan down here because they know they can have the same amount of talent at, I don't know if it's quite half, but at a significantly lower bottom line for their company. So we're getting out and trying to educate companies that it just really costs less to hire the same caliber of talent that you can get in the major metros, and even though it's tough, talent's tough everywhere, 
you can get it even more more readily available and maybe a little easier than if you're in the Bay Area. We were just talking to Robert, he was talking about how tough that is. So um, cost, talent, and just the cluster. For how small of a market that we are, it is very impressive to look at the, the large, medium, and, and the amount of small businesses that are in this area. When we get that data and we roll that out and say, we're consistently ranked as one of the best places to start a business, especially in IT. Oh, and by the way, we have two of the three largest data analytics companies in the world with major, either their, uh, either their, you know, their headquarters here or a major operation here. People say, whoa, really, in Raleigh, Raleigh, Durham? Yeah, actually, that, that's here. So I think it's a cluster, cost, and talent, many of which uh, you know, Michael had already expanded on, but that's something that we find and I find from first-hand experience that we're seeing as something that makes us edge out larger markets and uh, helps us win projects and, and grow the economy. I think they covered those two questions <laughs> far better than I could. Fair point, fair point. All right, Mr. Hogan, the uh, question I got for you is, what is the single greatest challenge for continued economic growth in North Carolina? And how can it be overcome? So we're talking about the state of North Carolina. State of North Carolina, your research, your work. Take it wherever you want. Wherever yeah. you want. <clears throat> Steer that, man. I think there's two things that we need to be on the lookout for. And I think the first, um, and you're probably well aware of this, I think the biggest challenge for continued growth in the state is that it's really spiky. If you look at a map of the state of North Carolina and you look at where job growth is occurring, it's very concentrated in a handful of areas. Um, and what we're seeing is that the remainder of the state, most many of the non-urban and micropolitan parts of the state. To my, a little bit about me first. I'm a, uh, I have a background in, in urban planning and economic development, regional economic development. Um, and I've had the opportunity to travel around North Carolina a lot um, and work on different uh, projects throughout the state and throughout the US and throughout the world. But the biggest challenge is that we're gonna continue to see a divergence between the kind of growth of jobs and population that we see in the Raleigh-Durham metro area, in the Charlotte metro area, and a few other pockets around the state. Um, and that's gonna have kind of two effects. On one hand, these major metro areas are gonna continue to grow faster than the infrastructure and the housing can keep up. And we're seeing that now as the uh, housing costs continue to, to increase and our highways get a little bit more congested every day. And, and I think I'm seeing nodding around the room, people are aware of that. And people are moving here not only from other parts of the US and other parts of the world, but also other parts of the state. So we'll see that start to concentrate around here. And then the other part is what happens in those small towns um, if their young and educated population decides they want to up and leave and they want to move somewhere else. And so one of the biggest challenges, I think, for the state as a whole is how do we take the energy and the innovation and the entrepreneurship that's going on here in the Triangle region <clears throat> and catalyze that and connect that to towns all around North Carolina. We have the example of going to the um, UNC Pembroke Center for Entrepreneurship, which is a small business incubator in downtown Pembroke, North Carolina. And if you've never had the chance to go to Pembroke, North Carolina, um, it's an incredibly inspiring place when you see the work that people are doing there and coming from that community um, and the work that's coming out of UNCP. But you're also reminded that it's a very different reality from what we're seeing here in the Research Triangle area. Um, and so to be able to see the economic growth uh, in sectors like tech, healthcare, bioscience, um, that we're seeing growing in this region and see that start to distribute more across the state, I think is gonna be one of the biggest challenges moving forward. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with that. <laughs> I absolutely do. The, the one thing I chime in, especially from a statewide perspective, and that, that's, that's very, very true. I don't remember the, the exact figures, but um, the, the UNC School of Demography has excellent reports that come out all the time. And uh, North Carolina's growing, but it's, it's basically in the metros. Even the triad is not seeing exceptional growth. So much less Robinson County and Pembroke. I mean, if we're, if we're being frank, these are areas that are really struggling. They're, they're hemorrhaging population, actually. 
But um, funny enough, I, I think that I, I'm only going to comment on the, the, the caveat I'll give. This is one, this is looking at it from one angle, and that's what I do, which is recruiting companies. That's only part of it, because that doesn't bring up better hospitals necessarily, and, but those things are really important. Um, things that the Charlotte Airport and the Banking Center in Charlotte and then the RTP region, they drive the economy for the entire state. But when you have Griffles and you have Novo Nordisk making big kind of R&D investments here, what that eventually turns into is a $2 billion investment in Johnston County. And when you have investments in, for instance, you know, Charlotte's a banking capital and a lot of it has gone there, but Gastonia, you know, Gaston County is one thing, but this is in Gastonia. If any of you are familiar with that part, they just got a huge, high-paying call center out there. That's a that's that's really outside of Charlotte. So we need to continue to make sure and, and have the long game in in view that we, we we want to and are always going to recruit a lot of the the high-tech, knowledge-based development here. But that can and does. You know, trickle out to areas, to, to Johnson County, to Onslow County, down to the down, down to Pender County and in, in the more rural areas, but that still doesn't solve the reality of what Michael's saying, that it's it's a lot more than jobs. It really is. It, it, it's complicated. So I, um, I'm going to end on an I don't know, but, but that's <laughs> difficult. It's true. I'll, I'll say one thing. I, in a former life, I was the public policy director for the state. Everyone here, state by the way. Carolina. Yes. I don't know if I I'll give you. I'll give you two. Based on, on Michael and Colin's points, two things we talked about that are challenges: this idea of the rural-urban um, sort of distance in North Carolina. So, one of the things that I'm an advocate for is we need to think less about urban versus rural. When you set it up in that regard, it's a zero-sum game: who's going to win and who's going to lose. Okay. That's, that's, not, that's not a good thing. We're all North Carolinians, no matter where we live. So in some regard, we need to think, what are we going to do as a state? So that's why I appreciate how you set the question up. So we have to think rural and urban. And I appreciate Colin's point because what we're seeing, there's a lot of examples of this. I'll give you one sort of, um, a couple of examples. We've seen um, this idea of sort of the, the griffles being uh, across the state. Ag tech is a huge growing industry in this state based on two things. One, sort of the technology, R&D, epicenter that is this region, and North Carolina's historic strength as an ag agricultural leader. So that's a rural and urban setup. So we have to set it up that way. Um, doesn't, that doesn't mean you're going to have RTP in Onslow County, where I grew up. Okay? That's, that's not going to happen. But what you can say is how can we sort of pre connect, have more connective tissue between the economy. One way to do that is investing in infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, I'm not, I'm not just talking about highways. I'm talking things like broadband, education is absolutely critical. If that's going to be the driver, we need to we have to invest in those things in a meaningful way um, across an entire state. Those are two of the and those are those are easy things to say. Really hard to do. I understand <laughs> that too. You know? And the other thing is there's a there's a like everything it used to be in this state, eastern North Carolina was the power in the economy because of agriculture and tobacco. That didn't last forever. That has changed. So that power base of the state has shifted west to the Triangle and to Charlotte. So the, we continue to evolve as an economy and as a state, and there's some level of that we're going to have to understand. That's sort of who we're going to have to be as, as we continue to evolve as a state. And it's, it's not going to be, I call it mayonnaising. You can't mayonnaise it across the whole state and everybody be equal. It's not going to ever be that way. It's going to be very difficult, but it's going to take a lot of very hard work and a lot of hard decisions to do. Well, that's not very fair. No, it's not very fair. Teasing. <laughs> I think what we're, uh, a lot of us are interested in is what, what kind of goes on behind closed doors to incentivize companies yeah. to come to North Carolina in general or a particular region in particular. Sure. You want to start with North Carolina and sort of give you an idea of why people yeah. care? Yeah. Um, so incentives, especially with the Amazon HQ2 uh, oh, so si situation <laughs> slash debacle <laughs> with what happened in New York and what is continuing to to unfold in Northern Virginia, uh, this is, uh, people suddenly care about and know what I do. Like, oh, you're in economic development? What do you think about HQ2? <laughs> I mean, seriously, the amount of questions that I've had from people who otherwise didn't know about it, it's, it's been exciting, it's been nice. But uh, that, 
a, a company with that type of cash getting the type of cash from taxpayers uh, has kind of thrust incentives into the national and social conversation, which I think is appropriate and good. Um, but the, the one thing that I do want to start, start off with, since that's such a big national conversation, North Carolina is very fiscally responsible with our incentives. So as taxpayers, it's good that we can all give ourselves a pat on the back. We've set things up that we do very well. We, do not, uh, we don't do upfront cash incentives basically at all. We have caveats and basically performance-based discretionary incentives are how almost all of our uh, incentives are set up. So that if you don't perform on the investment and the particular wages that you committed to within the jobs that you say you're gonna create, you don't get the money, it's that simple. Now, there are certain uh, funds that, that don't necessarily work that way, but they're infrastructure funds. So if we bring natural gas a mile down the road to a site, and the company that doesn't work out, oh, well, we, we lost on that, but that site is set up for the next person. But as far as cash to companies, which I care about, and I'm sure you do too, because that's your tax dollars, that's something that we do very well compared to other states. Funny enough, North Carolina is one of only four states that have got a triple A uh, uh, bond rating 20 years in a row. And we've had, and we've had it uh, for, for just a, a very long time. So again, I, I, I wanna set the stage with that, but we, we have a few different pots of money. When it comes to tech specifically, of high tech projects, they're usually looking in the metro areas or in the ring counties around that. Um, some of the major uh, to, you know, tools that we have in our toolbox, there's something called the Job Development Investment Grants called JDIG. That's what you saw um, Honeywell get uh, in their headquarters relocation to Charlotte. You saw Infosys get that. Um, you saw HCL get that. Um, I'm naming two Indian companies. Again, I, we're working with India. But the large tech companies that are creating usually more 250 jobs or more over a five-year period um, get that. But again, that's all performance-based, which is nice to know. So, um, but it, it's mostly uh, based on job creation from the state level, especially when we're talking about companies that are more creating jobs and not as high of investment. Um, when it gets into larger manufacturing, um, that changes a little bit, but it, it's case by case. It's totally discretionary. We do not have incentives set up that if you do X, you will get, if you do A, you'll get B. We don't do that, and for a reason. There are certain industry sectors that the state has chosen that we want to pursue more than others, um, but it's really dependent mostly on job creation and the wages. So we want to make sure that we're not giving uh, discretionary incentives to a company that's paying $7.25 an hour. We don't do that. Um, so that, that's from the state side at a very high level, but um, there's a totally other side to this that is equally important, and Michael will be yeah. in a better position to answer that. I think here in our, in our market, why do companies, to your point, why do companies, how do you incent companies to come here? Well, at the end of the day, they're coming here because of talent in our higher education ecosystem. They're coming here because of investments that we've made. Um, North Carolina does, is never going to win an incentive deal versus other states because we don't have to. We know people are gonna, we know companies want to be here, and they're gonna thrive here. That's why we're in the roles we are, is we want our communities to do better, we want those companies to thrive, because we know that's what the jobs are, that economic leveling for people, and so it's so important. So, for us in this community, really the big push is around, is around talent, to Colin's point, um, again, having studied incentives for a long time, what I like about North Carolina's incentives are, when North Carolina gives an incentive to a company, they're not taking like, well, let's take a little bit of money out of the school system budget, a little bit of money out of public health. Bit, it's a grant <clears throat> based on the percentage of withholdings that that company's paying to the state. So it's not, they're not taking tax dollars out of Collins' pocket to do it. It's a grant based on the amount of money that they're paying already. That wouldn't happen if without the project did. There's a yeah. legal ease, it's called the but for clause. But for these incentives, we would not come. And that's not just like a, hey, you know what I'm saying. That's a legal document signed by the CEO and the Attorney General of North Carolina. So that's not a wink and a nod. That's a, without these incentives, you're not coming. And so that's an important aspect. At a local level, our incentives are based on property taxes. So 
for us, and, and it's important also to think about incentives broadly, quickly, I want to talk about incentives. That's not the driver for our projects because we're not going to give large incentives. We don't because our tax rate's very low, one, <laughs> which is great. Um, two, um, if it's all the only sort of taxing authority that local governments have in North Carolina is property taxes and a portion of sales tax. Um, so for us, it's about net new ad valorem tax revenue. So our local incentives are based on a percentage based on that net new ad valorem taxes. It's very clearly outlined of what they're going to do. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really how our incentives work with the state incentives, work with um, money for workforce development. But incentives aren't the key driver. They're a part of that decision for a company. But the first things they're checking off before they talk about incentives for us is, is there talent there? Is there a pipeline there? Are there other companies I can partner with, et cetera, et cetera? And all of that comes into a, a very large decision matrix for companies, and they say yes or no to your community on that level. So really for us, I think if it was, that was a long way of saying it, one word I would say is it's talent, period. That's what drives it. Here. I'm happy to speak to talent, but I think that you all have uh, you, you've, uh, hit on that already. All right. Can you answer the content question? Uh, yeah. Great. So when, uh, Mr. Hogan, when you look at the uh, NC State or North Carolina's um, clean tech and IT and textile industries, what emerging trends do you see in workforce and automation? I think that... Um, Long question, sorry about that. <laughs> Mike's doing a study for us on this. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I've looked at a, a couple of different industries across the board um, in terms of tech. And I think that the first thing that I should tell you is that we talk about clean tech, IT, textiles. There's a tech workforce now that's going to have to be able to move seamlessly across those industries. And not just clean tech, not just IT, not just textiles, but pharma, manufacturing, healthcare, finance, ag tech, that the IT workforce, so when you think about um, folks who are either coming straight out of school or are kind of more seasoned IT professionals, there's going to be more seamless transition across these industries in North Carolina in terms of the tech talent and where they're choosing to go because there are, gonna, there are tech jobs now that are in manufacturing, that are in pharma, that are in healthcare. Um, and I think everyone around the, the room here could probably talk about how IT has interacted with their, um, with their industry. Um, so in the case of clean tech, things like smart grids, smart metering, analytics um, are all going to link that tech industry to uh, the energy production and, and tech industry. But I think more broadly, when you add manufacturing, when you add healthcare, when you add pharma, um, we're talking about IT and tech having a penetration across all these industries. And the thing that came to mind, I kind of got off track when I was thinking about this question this afternoon, the thing that came to mind was where, where is IT, where's the IT workforce going? Um, and I'm reminded of going to visit the New Belgium Brewery in Asheville. And if you go there, if you've ever been, um, the brewery is a, a totally integrated advanced manufacturing operation. They brought some, some engineers um, who were masters in optimized beer brewing from Germany, designed a system, and then built a building around it. Mm -hmm. But the core of that beer brewing operation is um, a room full of computers. Um, and so you have an IT workforce that's going to have to... Um, learn how to work across multiple different industries and have knowledge and capability within those industries that are things that are as diverse as basic IT services, smart metering, data analytics, advanced manufacturing to healthcare and beer production. Awesome. I'm sorry I got a little yeah. off topic. No, 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 you, <laughs> you ended strong. <laughs> you ended <laughs> real strong. <laughs> what you thinking it. about? Yes. Cheers. Colin, this one's for you, man. Um, so, you deal, uh, you work with European and Indian companies and bringing them to the US, specifically North Carolina, of course. How do you do that? How do you attract foreign investment dollars? And do you focus on a particular industry, like connected cars, the automotive industry, yeah. et cetera? Uh, so two, two pronged question. I'll take the first one. How, how, do, we, how do we attract companies? Yes, so indeed. I had mentioned this a, a little more um, in, in the conversation we had before. So I just returned from a two-week trip in India. We, 
again, backing up a little bit, and this is really the answer, it's, it's presence, just being there, which sounds, that, that's not sexy, it's not. <laughs> it's not like, well, we've got a really good incentive package for them, or we've got this perfect, it's just being there and telling the story. And I think we all, everyone's in sales, right? You, we're in a crowded, especially with IT, we're in a crowded marketplace. If you don't have a compelling story to tell, you're not gonna win the business. And if you're not there to tell the story, you're not gonna win the business because there are 15 other companies in this market that can do at least something surrounding or one at least one channel of your business. So really, <coughs> we're just out there trying to knock on doors and build relationships where other people aren't. Um, South Carolina is a state of six million people with compared to North Carolina, an extremely monolithic economy, uh, I, I would say. And they've done so much internationally with their size compared to what North Carolina has done. And, and, I'm, and I, I'm talking as someone that these are my direct competitors. They have, they have killed it in the past 20 years. Unbelievable what they've done in Europe. Unbelievable what they've done in India. That was, of course, helped by Governor Nikki Haley, but she, it wasn't just the fact that she had what was of Indian origin. It, she said, we are going to, we see, I see the writing on the wall, I see what India is doing. So they opened up an office before, before us, way before us. We just opened an office in November, and it was great. The legislature saw the fact that we needed to do this, and they wrote a line item budget funding for an India office. So that's up and running, but we're behind the ball. So it, it, it's up and going now, but uh, I say all that to say when I was there with our director of, uh, of, of investment in, in India, we we're just going around and talking to companies that are ready to expand, and you know what other states are talking to? No one. So where are they going to go? They're going to go to Arkansas that they know nothing about, or if they're looking, if they're looking in the southeast and they haven't talked to anyone else, and they're a, f a small molecule pharmacology manufacturing company, they're coming to North Carolina. Because we come to them, we say, listen, we've got this solution, we've got talent, we've got infrastructure, we've got consistently low taxes that we don't need to use incentives to offset, and we're gonna help you, and we're gonna make it happen. Project one. Now that's simplistic, but for a company that is setting up their first greenfield operation in the US, it is that simple, because they don't know, and they need a partner. So for India, it's different than Europe. Europe, we've been doing bilateral trade and investment for a really long time. Look at the amount of auto and aerospace OEMs that are in just the Southeast. It's unbelievable. India is a different story. It's very, um, it, it, it's, it's surrounding relationships. Uh, a, a perfect example of an initiative that I've started within that is we have uh, an advisory board called the India North Carolina Advisory Board. And it's people from all over the state that are Indian American or of Indian origin that are running businesses across all different sectors. And we basically just have them come together quarterly to provide high level strategy and then just to get on, get on the phone and meet with Indian companies when they come here to say, hey listen, I moved my family from Mumbai to start up this operation. We felt welcomed here, we loved it, and we're making money. Do deal's done at that point for a lot of companies. Again, speaking simplistically, but when things happen so consistently like that, it's, uh, th that's it. So the, the sales maxim that I kind of come to that we really bring to our business development work is the person who is present makes the sale. It's not even, it's not necessarily the best product or the cheaper price, but if you're there, you're building a relationship, you're, you're a really good chance of landing that investment or, or, or growing that account. So that's really what we're doing. And I know that's, that, that's not as, as fun of an answer, but just getting out there, finding if companies. If it's real and it's... it's yeah, that, that's, that, that's what it is. So, I mean, North Carolina has enjoyed a huge amount of foreign direct investment. And right now, uh, it's at, at least the interest is at an all-time high. Uh, especially... Can you buy that? Um, I'll give you one. Yeah, I'll give you some numbers. Yeah. We have about, we have over 700, and just in the, in Wake County in the region, over 700 foreign owned firms located here. It's a very large concentration. IT, life sciences, obviously, is sort of the big two for us, um, as well as clean tech. We have you know, put in the Schneider, Siemens, and other ABBs of the world. Huge presence in that regard. For us, 
in terms of like a project as Colin's referring to, for us it's like a company that we've had an interaction with in the last month. So it's a real client, it's not somebody that we talked to like two years ago in the hallway about something. These are real clients. We, have, we currently have 48 active projects to give you a sense of scale. That would account for about 8,000 jobs and about a billion dollars of investment. These are, this is big numbers. About 30% of those projects are for, foreign owned firms right now for us. So that gives you a sense of the scale, just, that's just one market, that's Wake County. Um, it gives you a sense of the scale of the interest in, in foreign owned firms in the marketplace. The biggest, the biggest sort of recent projects that we've had in this marketplace, Credit Suisse, uh, um, Infosys and others, those are all foreign, giant foreign owned firms for us. Mm -hmm. right. That's who we are as a community. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people in here know that Wake County Economic Development goes to South by Southwest events <laughs> yearly? Me. <laughs> why? You know, why did you start going? Or when did you start yeah. going? Why? A couple of things. You know, South by Southwest is sort of the, the largest, if you're not familiar, it's one of the largest digital. Um, and technology conferences in the world. Um, we do this, these types of events, we go to BIO, which is the world's largest life science show every year, and have like a big event, the governor comes, that we host him, talk about our life science industry. Similar to South by Southwest, it's sort of a couple of reasons that we go. One is it's important to let people understand at this global event who we are as a marketplace and why we're there. And so we've been doing this for about eight years, and it's evolved over that eight year period now. You know, we, we, we've done it a couple different ways. We've had, there's a big job fair, we participated in the job fair, talking about all the technology jobs that were available in the marketplace. This past year, um, we really had this really cool, we did a, a mural project with some of the, it's called the, the uh, sort of collective group here. They did, did those, the, the murals in downtown Raleigh and across the community. We did a big mural, it's about, it was a 20 foot by, uh, 13 feet by 20 foot mural that sort of gave people like this is who Raleigh is. It was all these really cool stats. It was done by this collective of artists, about seven of them. So it was really awesome. If you've read Raleigh Magazine, it's the back cover of Raleigh Magazine this month. You get a sense of it. It's really cool. And a lot of it's the soft sell of Raleigh. You know, we, we've sort of pivoted a little bit for this to really talk about who we are as a community for talent. You know, when you're talking, I mean, literally talk to over a thousand people a day at this thing over the course of five days. And it's cool because a lot of people are like, hey man, I love Raleigh, like I went to State, I went to Carolina, went to Duke, whatever. I really, you know, enjoy what's going on. Hey, what's going on? Hey, who, where, where is Raleigh? Whatever. <laughs> and it, it's cool because like, look, our next door neighbors at this thing was the Japan experience. And then the year before it was the UK and Richard Branson was there. Okay, that's who your neighborhood is. So for us, it's about waving the flag to say, look, Singapore, Japan, Richard Branson, Raleigh, all the same. Uh, these awesome technology markets and for us it's about planting the flag you have to wait you have to tell people who you are um, and that's an important aspect for us it's not about finding projects or companies that are going to move here more than anything else it's about talent everything we do is about jobs everything we have a national media campaign that we operate we get about two stories a month placed in national media so articles in Forbes livability orbits Wall Street Journal things like that and they'll talk about beat Amanda Cool. They'll talk about a neat entrepreneur. Cool. Talk about Ashley Christensen. Cool. And all that's about is telling the story of our community in its broadest sense. I'll give you an example of how does that work? Yeah, it works. We've had we did a story. This is seven years ago now. We did one of those Delta Sky Mile pieces. When you open up in some community, we did one of the first ones they did it was about the Triangle. It was really awesome. We had all these sort of luminaries from you know the, the region talking about why they're here and what they love about it. So it just so happened some executive read it. Came back to his CEO, man, this is a place we need to check out. Not right now. <laughs> Seven years later, that guy's the CEO of the company, and we're working with him to move his headquarters from New York City to here. So it's that kind of, I mean, that's like real world. Yeah. And so you have to do that. We have a saying, we play to a parade, not a crowd. Meaning, we're a crowd. If we all say, if we say it one time, we're probably going to get it. The world is a parade. It's constantly marching in front of you. If you're not telling your message over and over and over and over until you're sick of it, you better say it one more time, you lose out. And so for us, that place like South by Southwest, that's what we're doing. It's, about, gotcha. it's about telling the global marketplace who Raleigh is and why we're in the better. One last question for the panel, and we'll open it for Q&A. Apple and Amazon, why are they not here? Yeah. Why? <laughs> 
I'll give you, I'll, I'll start it quickly. We talked about this at our table a bit before. A couple things. One, we went, you know, we went through this process. It was sort of funny because I remember the day that, so why did Amazon do this the way they did? It's a question we get a lot. Like, why did they make it so public? Well, part of it is, is you're going to talk about hiring 50,000 people and investing $6 billion. It's a secret from the time you say it in a room till you walk out that door, and then everybody in the world knows about it. So they sort of, as I say, Amazon disrupts how you buy books and how you're going to travel to the moon. And in between there, they disrupted economic development. Now, the whole time we did this, sort of the economic development crowd said, at some point, this is going to become a real project. It's going to go from this very public thing to a very traditional project, which is going to be NDAs and it's going to be site visits and all that sort of jazz. We also knew from the outset that we want to position our, market, our marketplace as who we are, which is a region that is focused, that is talent focused and future focused. We're, therefore, we didn't send a cactus to Seattle like Phoenix, Arizona did. And that, that, yes, yeah. they sent a cactus. Like that was going to win. Damn, we got a cactus. <laughs> like a big cactus? Or like a big a cactus. cactus. Yeah, it got intercepted cactus. on the way. It was like a 20, it was like a real life. It wasn't a cactus. Wait, it was wait, a wait. cactus. <laughs> and they, they, they put it like in, the, in like one of the arboretums in town. You know? yeah. So it was like, there's some of that. And so the, these 260 you know, places around the country and around North America applied or whatever. For us, we knew, look, we're going to stand up on who we are, which is a region. So a couple of things really quick before I say about the why not, I'll say the why we were excited and what, and what it means to us as a community. One, what I think we showed best in, in the company, and we've been told this is, wow, you guys partner better than a lot of other people around the country. And one not, need not look farther than our neighbors in the Commonwealth to the north. <laughs> Literally, they had three applicant, applicants that were next to each other, and they couldn't agree on a single application. We, the day this thing happened and became public, we had a meeting in our office. Our partners in Durham, um, our partners at the Research Triangle Park, the state, and everybody else saying, we're going to do this as a region and as partners like we do everything else every day. Great, cool. Um, so that was important for us. The ecosystem, the higher education ecosystem shined. Um, it's important for us is that, you know, when you have the chancellors of like NC State, Carolina, the president of Duke, in the room with, for us, the president of Wake Tech, and companies see them, and they see each other as peers, that means something. It's not like, well, we're the four-year schools and you're the technical community college. It's like, no, we're peers. We're all educating sort of North Carolina and the world's workforce. That was important. Why aren't they here? You know, they went through this process realizing they couldn't go to not just one place, not two places, they had to go three places to fulfill this. And now they're doing it across 16 locations. So at the end of the day, the, the, the process sort of illuminated to them. It really, what their initial thought what it was going to be, totally changed. The other thing we talked about is, is quickly is this thing. The idea of like, hey, we, we lost Amazon. Whether it's a, yeah, we lost Amazon, or like, oh, we lost Amazon. Uh, no matter where you come out on that, it's important, and I, and I, I say this a lot is, because what keeps me up at night more than anything else is complacency. And so, for us, when people say, hey, you know, well, those 50,000 people that are going to move here, they're not. We solved all those problems with transit and transportation. Man, it was done. I remind people, every single year, we grow by 23,000 people in Wake County. That 50,000 that Amazon was talking about was 20 years. So do 23 times 20 years. That's how we're going to grow. So in some ways, Amazon's baked into the numbers of this marketplace already. If they would have come. That's, that was my thought. Um, now, the difference is you have a behemoth in town that hires a lot of people. That's, that's a whole different story. So on one level, losing it didn't impact us, I don't think, in the long run. I think being on that top 20 list was great. We were the smallest metro on that list. From the very beginning, we knew that. That's something we, we take pride in. We just, today, I got a, a list. We do a, we compare Raleigh to the other top 100 metros in the country across 206 different indicators of economic prosperity. Um, we have an economist that we pay to do it, and he does this across the country, and we're really excited. We got the numbers today. Here's the top five. Five up. Charlotte, Dallas, Seattle, Austin, Raleigh. Raleigh finished number one for the third year in a row across these different indicators. And that's important. So all these communities are very similar. They're all tech-enabled, really smart, advanced, future-focused places. What they don't have in common is we're the smallest. You know, so we, again, we're, our competition isn't Columbia, South Carolina, or Tallahassee. It's 
Austin, Texas, San Francisco. For life science, it's Switzerland, as in the country of Switzerland. Um, so that's who our competition is. It was great to be on that top 20 list. I think it meant a lot for us. So in, in the end of the day, I think it was fine um, when these things don't happen. Hey, look, sometimes you don't win projects for no fault of your own. Um, Apple's had a relationship with Austin. That's their largest operation outside of California. They've been in Austin for 20 something years now. They're very comfortable there and it's an easy decision. Sometimes easy is the easiest thing to do in a boardroom, right? Same thing when you're thinking about foreign owned firms. The re why do so many foreign owned firms start off in New York, Chicago, or LA? Because in that boardroom, they know where New York, Chicago, and LA actually are on a map. So it's an easy decision. I can be in Germany and go, yeah, New York. I know where that is. Cool, let's go there. Um, so those sometimes those decisions just happen that way. So. Got it. Got it. Anyone else? I think um, in light of, or we were kind of going back and forth on this this question about, and Michael was talking about, we're, when you look at these lists, and Raleigh's on a lot of lists, you look at the Raleigh and the Research Triangle area, and they're the good lists to be on. Um, I remember listening to a, a former mayor of a city say how his city was on the list for the top 20 most obese. So we're not, we're not on that list. We're <laughs> on the, the list for the top, top tech, top places to live, top places for millennials to start a business. Uh, but I think there's still some challenges. As Michael said, we're not competing with Columbia, South Carolina. We're competing with Boston and Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. And we're small. I was pulled a couple of numbers today. And when you look at the number of people working in Business, financial operations, computer, and math oper and math occupations. So these are the types of jobs across all industries. Here, there's 120,000 approximately. If you combine the Raleigh and the Durham MSAs, in Boston and Atlanta, that number is over 300,000. In Washington D.C., in the metro, that number is almost 550,000. So if a big company's looking and they're just looking purely at the size of the talent pool they can recruit from, on paper here, it's still pretty small. Now we have a lot of people coming out of our universities. We're having really rapid growth. But if a company's saying we want to come in and we want to be able to hire 500 tech workers from day one, I struggle to find 500 tech workers who are sitting on the sidelines right now in this region looking for a job. Or anywhere. Because uh, they're, uh, you know, that 120,000 people who are in business, finance, computer, mathematical jobs, those people who are working right there's people who are in in-demand jobs that are that are paying well. So I think that's one challenge. And as you said, um, there's no there's a, if you're a company in, in Germany or the UK and you're looking for that direct one-shot international flight to get to where you want to go, we're still behind on that. We're working on it, and our airport continues to expand. We continue to have more and more direct flights, more airlines. Uh, but if they say, hey, we can get on a one-stop, you know, uh, or a non-stop direct international flight to Washington, D.C. or New York City, that can often be a, a big determinant as well. So as the, the airport and the, the infrastructure here continues, it's got to continue to keep up with that growth and not just the, as you, we've been talking about, kind of the roads and the highways, but also getting those direct international flights. Yeah. One of the things we talk to companies a lot about in that regard is, this is a marketplace that I, what I say is this is a place that invests in itself. Meaning we're growing really fast and the, the initial question is, well, how are you dealing with that growth? I use a couple of examples. I say, you know, look, November we passed a bond in this community for $548 million for school updates and upgrades and building. We're investing in ourselves. We're trying to stay up in front of it as much as you can. Two years ago, we passed a referendum for a half cent sales tax increase that will be, give us at a minimum, $100 million a year in locally controlled funding exclusively dedicated to transit and transportation. Okay, that's not a piggy bank to pull from when you need it, or a rainy day fund, that's for transit and transportation. So that allows us to build out a transit infrastructure focused on bus rapid transit and commuter rail. Those are the types of things that we're doing, to, to Michael's point, the, the airline. You know, what's great is, this is the most connected mid-sized airport in America. We're not a hub. We also have cheaper flights than the, the hub airports do. The reason they're a hub is because they have one carrier that dominates them and can set the price. What's exciting about our airport is flights are cheaper because you have like eight people buying for your dollar. Yeah. You have you know, Delta and, and American Airlines where we're going back and forth on who's gonna be the biggest. Southwest is on their heels. Frontier, you know, some of these other sort of, sort of disruptive carriers that are in the mix. 
this idea of so we're continuing to grow, you know, we're investing in the airport, adding a brand new runway, you know, with the idea of, and it's this super audacious goal of we're gonna have a direct flight to China. That's audacious, and that's, it's almost like, whoa, that's the goal of our airport, is to have a direct flight to China, and it makes sense. We have Lenovo's headquarters here, we have three headquarters, one of them which is here. So it's that kind of thing, that investing in ourselves allows us to sort of be better, and not getting trapped in trying to catch up. You know, we use the story of two good stories about catching up really quick. Austin and Seattle. Seattle, in the 19, late 60s, the federal government said, look, we got all this extra money. You want to build out a transit infrastructure system? No. Nah. That money went to Atlanta. That built off MARTA. Not the best system in the world, but a bit, an entire system that allowed Atlanta to grow around it. Well, recently, last 20 years or so, Austin, same thing. You want to build out this large infrastructure? No. Austin now is playing massive 10-year catch-up just to catch up to those things. Going back to Seattle, Seattle passed a bond this year uh, for their transit infrastructure for $56 billion. That's two state budgets in North Carolina for transit in one metro. It gives you a sense of if you don't Play, if you don't think about what you're doing at the time and thinking about who you're going to be as your trajectory presents itself, you're never going to catch up. So. And what, the, the one thing I'll add, I heard, I, I, many of you probably know this, I, I didn't know this, that uh, Charlotte's airport, depending on how you splice the statistics, if you take just uh, take off and landing, it's the sixth busiest airport in the world. Yeah. Again, it's a lot of small commuter flights. But that is the major economic driver for, um, uh, for Charlotte, well, for both of the Carolinas, especially South Carolina. You know, Charlotte's South Carolina's biggest city in, in, in reality, and, and, and they'll claim that, just like we claim the Port of Charleston many times for, for that on, on industrial projects. But the, the one thing that I want to back up to is that, and just to follow up with that, that um, the U.S. Airways hub, I believe, was offered to Greensboro decades back when they said, no, now it's in Charlotte. And of course, Charlotte has other things going for it, but being the number one economic driver in Charlotte, I mean, the, what would what Greensboro have been? It's yeah. just one of those big what ifs that it, it's not a useful exercise to go past that. But again, that, that's a salient point. And, and the one thing I want to say about Amazon and Apple, and of course, it's kind of, we're in a comfortable space saying, well, it doesn't matter, you know, we're, uh, you know, consoling ourselves. Of course, we would have liked to win that, but let me tell you what, again, just to go something Charlotte-centric, you know who was thrilled that Charlotte got eliminated? All the banks. They were terrified. They were terrified because they're all tech companies. That, that, that's, all they, that's all they do now. They were absolutely terrified of Charlotte being on that initial list because they were going to lose all of their talent. Because Amazon has enough money to pay 125, 130% of market rate, take all the best people. So they said, thank God. They really did. And I think a lot of companies here, did any of you happy that the biggest, richest, the two richest tech companies in the world didn't come in and probably take a lot of your talent? I mean, again, this is, this is, this is non-PC to say this, but there are blessings that are part of that. And just uh, Cree, just announced a billion dollar expansion. Who knows if they would have been as comfortable making that expansion if Amazon was bringing up 50,000 jobs here. So again, it would have been really nice to have that. We would have welcomed that. It would have been the win of the century. But there are a lot of companies that would advance auto parts, had moved their headquarters here. Who knows? Again, but these things are very much linked. And it's funny, did, did you see, uh, a large amount of announcements happen in this region right after we got eliminated from that list. So again, these things are all linked. So we should not be licking our wounds, really. We should be super proud, especially with Michael and his team and the region team. They, they killed it. They left it all in the field, and uh, our area is, has jumped up into the national platform for tech because of it. And we're seeing other massive wins because of that. So I, I think we're in a good place, and uh, yeah, awesome. it was really encouraging to see. Audience questions? Yeah, hey, Wendy, how are you? Yeah. Question for you guys. I read just recently, within the last week or so, the city of Rockland Mountain is investing to become a competitor in the Atlanta Metro Area. Yeah. Is that something that you guys are looking at doing? Is that something that you're interested 
they're, I mean, they're, the investment's being made, they're primarily by Mr. Goodman, you know, who owns Capital Broadcasting, WRL, in the Rocky Mountain Mills area. Um, that, that story, I know the story you're refer, referring to specifically, and really what it was about is, hey, Rocky Mountain's developing its first mixed use neighborhood, which is what attracts sort of entrepreneurs and people to the community. Um, well, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina, so I've got nothing but, but love for it. Um, and I think it's exciting. I, I think it's the first step in a long road uh, for a community like Rocky Mount. So it's really exciting that investment's being made and the focus is being made on it. They've got, they've got a really cool part of that. It's a really cool um, entrepreneurial space for, you mentioned breweries, Mike, the local breweries that are being developed out of there. So I think it's perfect. I think it, I think it, and the other thing, I, I think it adds to more broadly as sort of a, a broader mega region. When you think about it, 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 we can rely on those assets of sort of this market impacting what it means for Rocky Mount. So again, I don't see Rocky Mount as a competitor. Like I don't see Charlotte or Durham as a competitor. Um, you know, Durham's a partner of mine, not a competitor. So same with Rocky Mount. I would, I think it's exciting they're doing that, and it's needed. We need that across Eastern North Carolina. It's a great example of how we can make strategic investments um, at, at, from the private sector to drive economic activity in communities. I think it's the, a great example we can do across North Carolina. And I'd like to add to that that I, I don't know if, did, did they, I, I guess the, the term competitor came out um, I definitely wouldn't see it as competition just because, I mean, the, the major thing that Rocky Mountain lacks is the educational infrastructure that this area has. But that, that sounds negative. It's not. You know what the Triangle doesn't have? Doesn't have? A, a huge tire manufacturer that just landed a $550 million investment there. So there, there are different types of high-tech applications that are going to be a little more applicable in that area than they are here. So really, I, I'd love for the, the areas to link up more because yeah. it's not gonna be in competition. I mean, we, we work statewide projects all the time. It has, it, it does not happen that Wake County competes with Edgecombe County literally ever. And, and, and it won't, and, that, and that's good. But are they tied together and can they help each other? In a huge way, you've got Pfizer out there, you've got big, large scale pharma and life science manufacturing, advanced manufacturing happening in a way that it, 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 it can't happen at the same scale in Wake County because of some cost. Well, it could, but if you can go to Wilson or Edgecombe County, certain things are gonna push yeah. one county out. And, and again, that's good. And that's how that's one of the ways we combat what, what Michael was speaking about. So I, I love it and I encourage it. And I hope that it's not viewed as competition from them, but that the, the, the two can work together. And I'm sure they will. Yeah, I think that addresses two things that we mentioned <coughs> earlier. One is that, um, as I mentioned before, so much of this economic growth in the state in the last 10 to 15 years has been really concentrated in the Triangle and in the Charlotte metro regions. Um, and it's left a lot of, of these smaller cities asking, well, what do we do? Where do we have a part in this? Um, and I think a, a project like that, where you're having an investment you know, from the private sector and public side to coming together um, with a focus on really developing a local um, and resilient kind of entrepreneurial economy, um, I think is a model that a lot of other cities in North Carolina are gonna be taking notice of. Um, and they see what, what's happening in Wilson, um, and Wilson is a, a town that has, um, you know, has said, we're gonna take charge, we're going to lead on high-speed broadband, we're gonna bring tech-based companies here and get them you know, access to really high quality internet access at a low cost. Um, and it's a, it's a model I think that other towns around North Carolina are looking to. And the second point I think, and Michael mentioned this earlier, is that um, economic development here is about collaboration. And I didn't fully appreciate that until I had gone and worked with economic development organizations in other states and other cities and it was eye-opening to see that if you go to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., Montgomery County, Prince George County, Northern Virginia are all fighting each other. They're not, they're not collaborating, and if you talk to people who live up there, they'll, they'll say, you know, well, what, is, what does Maryland think of Virginia? They, they don't talk to each other. Whereas around here, what does Durham County think of Wake County? They're talking to each other every day. 
and working together on how to collaborate. So I think that's something that we see across the state of North Carolina, and I think something that's made economic development in this region really unique is that folks who are working at the city, county, regional, and state level, they don't see it as a game of winners and losers. They see it as a game of, if we're seeing investment in Rocky Mount, we're seeing investment in Wilson, that's great. That's good for the state as a whole, it's good for the triangle, it's good for the surrounding area. What, one thing I'll tack on to that to literally validate that, we're in a very high tech, autonomous vehicle tied <laughs> project that is considering this region, the, the company is looking at a Wake County location. The guy in Durham, still involved, still bringing uh, companies to come in and, and talk with the company. We're competing against Montgomery County, and we had a call with the consultant today and said the number one thing that could win us the project is the, our collaboration. Yeah. The fact that we, we've got GK Butterfield, in, which is uh, based Wilson. in Wilson, um, uh, in DC saying, you need to go talk it, across the aisle. It, it, it's it's bipartisan. It's e, it, you know it's rural and and urban. People are saying you need to go talk to Tillis. You need to go talk to Burr. They're all helping each other. You go, need to go talk to Price. And just saw it at the economic development levels from the local all the way through the federal. It's totally different than what's happening in an area like Montgomery County that we're actually competing against for this project. And it's the company is taking note and telling us that. So yeah. it's totally true. No, it's something that's very unique and something that. I think if, if you were here for a long time, we're just kind of accustomed to that. But we laugh because, because Raleigh, if you look at the US statistics from the Census Bureau, Raleigh and Durham are different MSAs. But all of us who live here know that that's not true. When you say MSA, what do you mean? So the, the Census Bureau does statistics on when you look at a metro area. So the Washington DC metro area spans across three states plus the District of Columbia, several counties, and it's supposed to kind of mean where the economic activity is occurring between commuting um, and companies, uh, where companies work. The Charlotte metro area includes a lot of counties in South Carolina because that's where a lot of people live who work in the city of Charlotte. But the Census Bureau for some reason defines Raleigh and Durham as separate metro areas. And so when you cross that line between Wake County and Durham County, you probably don't even realize it first off, because um, if you go you know, north versus south of RTP, but the uh, national statistics will say that you're in two different metro areas. So it is something that makes um, the data a little bit funny, and sometimes in, you know, the, the, I was talking about the lists earlier, sometimes on these national rankings, Raleigh and Durham will be shown separately, um, which I think to us is a little bit of a detriment because it makes our market look smaller than it actually is. Good question, Wendy, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I have a talent question. So you mentioned that we have a, a great situation in terms of talent. We have great universities and a lot of people are getting degrees. My question goes back to the age of the talent. So if I talk to kids right now, they're not interested necessarily in driving and getting cars. And so one of the conversations that's been had is transportation. And so I know a number of kids who graduated from NC State or Chapel Hill and have gone on to go to San Francisco or Seattle because the transportation is better. What are we doing to fix that? Because it doesn't appear that we're on a good trajectory for that right at the moment. I'll say a couple <laughs> things about that. Um, one, those communities, DC, San Francisco, LA, have these huge legacy systems built out. Um, one of the things we were talking, joking about the other day with the Washington, for instance, the, the Metro right now, you know, half the system's closed right now. Half the system's closed. So if you relied on it, you're out of luck right now, uh, one. Two, it's a massive investment. It's nice to have the federal government as your partner to make sure that your Metro is aligned and always operating, because it has to, because that's all their employees and them. So it's nice. For us locally, we are, I mentioned earlier, we're not a transit community. I'm very clear about that when I talk to people that come in. We're, we are a car-centric community still. But as I mentioned before, we, have a, we passed that referendum two years ago now that's allowing us to build out a transit infrastructure system that makes sense for us, um, which is, one, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, connecting sort of the core of the community. The other thing I'll say about that, so 
that's sort of where we're, we're, we're and I say we have, a, it's more than a play, it's not a play on the shelf, it's actually being implemented right now as we move forward uh, with, with commuter rail. That's different from the light rail that was going to connect Durham and Chapel Hill that's been scrapped. Commuter rail runs on existing lines, the CSX, Norfolk, Southern lines that are owned by the McConnell Railroad. Existing lines, BRT is important because for, there's a lot of people, in, like in any community, I always think about our transit has to have sort of three Fs and an E, it has to be sort of, you know, you have to have a frequency of use. It doesn't matter, hey, we've got this great system. If it's not, if it's less than, if it's over 15 minutes, people aren't going to use it because I'm not going to wait for it, right? So it has to be very high frequency. This idea is sort of future focused. Has to, you have to have a system in place that's going to allow new technology, autonomous vehicles, whatever the next thing is, to be able to run on it. So this idea is sort of future focused. Uh, flexible, as we continue to grow, this isn't a hub and spoke community. LA and these other, in DC, everybody comes in, everybody goes out. We are this sort of multi-point. It's downtown Raleigh, it's North Hills, it's Western Parkway, it's the park, it's downtown Durham, et cetera. You know, we're, we're all over the place, so we're sort of commuting this way instead of everybody, so it makes it hard to have a big, robust, pointed system where everybody's gonna go this and then that. So it's a little different for us, so this idea of being flexible, so hey, as we grow, we can, we can utilize this system in different ways. That's why buses are, are a big driver for the current system for us. I always say the E part of that's about equity. So when we're talking about a transit infrastructure system, we have to remember first that you can't just rely on, hey, what's the best system to get me from downtown Raleigh to the airport? Well, I have a choice on how I get to the airport. I have a car. What about the people in this community who don't have a choice, who rely on public transportation every day for their only means of transportation? If you keep them in the equation for this idea of equity, then you can't say, let's invest all of our money in a train system that's going to connect like downtown to the airport to the park. Because the highest level of ridership in this community is Southeast Raleigh in the region. That's the highest level of current ridership. So the idea of we have to make sure the people who utilize transit every day right now are still a part of that conversation. You're right. That's why we have to build out a system that makes the most sense for this community and for this region. And it's something that we, we've worked really hard on. And within our organization at the Chamber, the Raleigh Chamber, we have the Regional Transportation Alliance. It's a 22 county regional business led group focused on transportation. Some of the projects they've done are things like the, the Expressway 540. That was going to be a 25 year build out. It was five years instead because the business community got involved to lead that. Accelerating 540 the rest of the way, leading the charge on that. Those are the types of things. And then this referendum was was led by RTA and the chamber to say we have to do this. But you're right, people are going to leave. Opportunities are, are whatever. Um, I will say that the majority of students that do graduate from State Carolina and Duke um, are actually remain local. About 53% of them still live in Wake County. 65% of them live in North Carolina. So we're the nice thing is we're retaining the bulk of our talent in the marketplace. But transit and transportation is a huge challenge for us because we're growing. It's, it's one of, what I always say is when people say what are the biggest challenges in this marketplace, it's always interesting because it's, it's two sides of one coin. It's all the positives that I just talked about. The other side of that coin are the challenges. We're growing. We have all this economic prosperity. Things are great. The other side of that coin is about affordability, transit, transportation, things like that. So you have to, you have to be able to address the good and the challenges. The good news is what we're not faced with are places like where I grew up where everybody leaves. All the kids I grew up with all live in Raleigh. We all left Envelope County. You know, unless you got a family business or something like that, you're gone. So we're not, the good news is we're, we're solving for problems that are, or challenges that are like the proper challenges you, you want to have around growth. But transportation is going to be a challenge for us because we're scrolling so fast. You know, and if you've lived here for more than 20 years, it's like a huge deal. I always joke, like it used to be if you got stuck on the highway on 40 and you're on the way to work, it was like, well, I'm on the way to work. I'm supposed to be like rrr, angry about it. It's a different thing when I'm just trying to go to the Harris Teeter and I'm stuck in traffic. Then it's like, oh, this is my time. You know, that's not fair. I don't, the, the boss's time, I don't care about me. So. so it is a challenge for us. And it's, it's something, the good news is, is, Again, I can say it's something that we're investing in solving for as a community. It's not just a, a passive, like, what are we going to do about it? But we're investing, you know, a billion dollars over a decade on it. That's an important aspect. So to be respectful of the time, we're, we're at the end of the program. Hopefully you